Today's episode of the podcast is brought to you by Eccentric, the makers of the K-Box and the new K-Pulley. Guys, flywheel training's really grown in popularity of late, and although it's something that's been around for a while, the simple reason that it's grown in popularity is because it works. We've been lucky to have a K-Box in our weight room for the past three years, and we've seen some really great things when it comes to improving the athlete's ability to change direction, and then looking at our return to play protocols with different lower body injuries with the student athletes. The love-hate relationship that everyone has with the K-Box is now just going to grow more with the addition of the K-Pulley. The ability to do standing presses, pulls, rip-throughs, and knee drive exercises is just going to be another arsenal to our training and another addition to the love-hate relationship that our student-athletes have with the awesome tools that come from Eccentric. Go ahead and hop over to Eccentric.com today to check out what they have. Guys, I can't recommend it enough, and I guarantee you won't be disappointed not just with the products, but with the awesome customer service that Eccentric provides. Hey, everybody. If you enjoy the podcast and the content that it provides, make sure you hop over and check out the all-new Strength Coach Network. The Strength Coach Network is the combination of the CVA SPS community and the Rugby Strength Coach community, bringing you what is sure to be the Internet's leading resource for continuing education for strength and conditioning professionals. Combining these two resources has allowed us to bring some of the best content from some of the best minds in the world together for your one-stop shop to better improve the continuing education for not just yourself, but your entire staff. Bringing together all of the lectures from the Rugby Strength Coach community, along with the lectures exclusively done for the Central Virginia Sport Performance community, and all the lectures performed at the Central Virginia Sport Performance Seminar, make this an absolute must for performance coaches around the world. The world-class lectures at the Strength Coach Network are not all that you'll see as well. The discussion in the forums and the support and the career guidance from some of the top practitioners in the world, from people all over the world, makes this an absolute must and a great place for you to network, learn, and grow as a performance professional. So hop on over to strengthcoachnetwork.com and use the code CVASPS, that's C-V-A-S-P-S, to get your 48-hour trial for only a dollar. We're sure you're going to find great value in the Strength Coach Network and are really excited to have you involved. So hop on over to strengthcoachnetwork.com and use the code CVASPS to check it out today. Hello and welcome to the podcast. Today, guys, I have the absolute pleasure of sitting down and talking with Coach Mike Boyle about what sports-specific training is in his mind. Guys, this stems off of these monologues that Coach Boyle has been doing on Instagram where there's been a a little bit of controversy and confusion surrounding the idea of sports-specific training. Coach is going to get into what he thinks it is, uh, what he thinks it isn't, uh, what he thinks and how he sees 90% of training when it comes to athletes that he works with and uh, gets into even how they run their needs analysis to to drive the training of their athletes. This is really an awesome talk, guys. I hope you enjoyed as much as I did. Let's get right to it. Coach Boyle, thank you so much for spending the time with us today. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. This is my first time on this famous podcast. Yeah, well, I don't know about famous, but it's uh, I'm really excited for this. This is this is a you're a person I've been hoping to get on the show for a while. And now we have a pretty interesting topic to discuss because you've been doing these these daily monologues on Instagram and there seems to be some people that have, uh, let's just call it some sort of like a fake confusion when it comes to what you're talking about when we're dealing with the 90% with training. Um, so let's start there. Let's talk about that for a little bit and let's see if we can kind of clarify some of this for some people. Yeah, the Instagram thing, I think I found my niche with these little one-minute videos, but at the same time, it is hard to get across your point, and I guess that's part of the challenge, is, and I realized with the sports-specific one, okay, based on the comments, I didn't accomplish my goal, but what my, my point was, and somebody said, it the, the, so two weeks ago, I put up a post and said, what do you guys want to hear about? And so I went through all the comments and they were a bunch of, you know, what do you think about sports specific training? So I just was, I sit in the car right before I go in the gym, I spend literally two minutes. I spend a minute recording it and a minute putting it up on Instagram. And I just, it sort of came out, sports specific training is bullshit. And I have no idea why people are trying. It drives me crazy when 
parents come to me and say, oh, my kid's a basketball player. Do you have a basketball specific program? And I always look at them and I say, to be perfectly honest, no. And the good thing for me, I think because we're so established in the industry as a business is that we can get away with that because people are normally they're taken aback in terms of what do you mean? And I'm like, I don't really have a basketball specific training program. Your son, daughter, whatever it is, already has one of those. It's called practice where they go and they do basketball specific training. My job is to do things that are complementary to basketball, make you bigger, make you stronger, make you faster, make you jump higher. But we're not going to, you know, med ball jump shoot. You know, we're not going to put a rim up and try to chuck an eight pounder through the hoop. And we're not going to practice dunks with a medicine ball or, or we're not going to jump and try to make it look like a layup. And I think there's a lot of this kind of phony, what I would call phony crap in the industry where people, I think, try to play too hard to that. I, I think it's a parent audience. They try to play hard. And sometimes it's a coach audience because we get it still, you know, you're in this college world you still get it from coaches. And so my whole thing was that I think you need to package it so that it is pleasing to the consumer, be that a coach, a parent, or an athlete. But what you're packaging does not drastically change. A hundred percent. And I think that kind of to, to piggyback with that, you know, you talked about the 90% and for the most part, that's what people would refer to as the general. And then you talk about the 10% that's different. And those are the things that as kids get more and more advanced in their training and become better and better athletes that may take a little bit more percentage of the training. But those are the things that kind of fit more along that lines of dynamic correspondence. Yeah. And I think in some cases, I mean, I know for us, we still don't really do that much of that in terms of, I guess, you know, you look at like dynamic correspondence, I think you know, in medicine balls, in plyos, you know, if you look at sort of the, uh, the Bosch stuff, there are some things that maybe you can think they're going to look slightly more sport imitated. But my whole thing is that most of these sports look alike. They involve running and jumping in the vast majority of the cases. Yes, there are highly specific cases like baseball pitching or um, I'm trying to think of some other ones that are really, you know, super specific. But and I can't even really come up with that many rowing. As a, for instance, where, you know, you're facing in one direction, going in the other, and you're pushing with two legs. There are some, and it, I always go back. I don't know if you've ever had Marco Cardinale at any of your conferences, but he spoke at um, Art Horns, one at Northeastern. The name is escaping me right now, but uh, I went and listened to him. And the first thing that he said was he had a slide up, and he said, this is the conversation I had to have with every coach in London when I when Cardinale was running the the – kind of strength and conditioning effort for the London Olympics for the British Federation. He said, every coach, I had to say, your sport's not different. You just think it is. And everybody is so sort of nuanced in their sport that they can't look at the idea that it's like, okay, it's knee dominant, hip dominant, push, pull, core. I don't care if you ride a freaking bike. I don't care if you row. I don't care if you jump up in the air. It's still knee dominant, hip dominant, push, pull, core where we get ourselves in trouble, and I've seen guys lose their job over this, our problem as American strength coaches is we wanna make everybody a freaking power lifter. And that puts sport coaches off, and I get that part. So when you go to the soccer coach and you start trying to sell back squat and deadlift and clean from the floor, they're like, no, 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 that's American football, we don't do that. And I'm like, okay, you need to make a better in-category choice for this sport when we're thinking knee dominant, hip dominant, you need to give them something that will be more palatable to where they are as an athlete, as a parent, as a coach, where they are on the scale of strength and conditioning. So some of it is meeting people where they're at. My athletes in general, I don't have to meet them where they're at. They go where I want them to go. And yet I still, to some degree, meet them where they're at. But I can say for, for us, if you're young and healthy, you're gonna hang clean, you're probably going to trap bar deadlift. You're going to do chin ups. You're going to bench press, and that won't matter to me what sport you play. So then, when we do start looking at that ten percent, what are the things that you're looking at when you are looking at things that may deviate some uh, of these land based sports? I think really what the ten percent almost falls into for us 
really is either kind of common patterns or injury trends or things like that, like specific things that we want to do. And even some of that to me is a little bit of window dressing. It's like with the baseball guys, if you don't give the baseball guys arm care work, then you're a bad strength coach. So you've got to kind of look at the list and say, okay, what does, what does my consumer want to see in their program that's going to make them think that it is in fact sports specific? Because they may think that it is. I have athletes all the time who tell me, you know, you guys, you're so sports specific for hockey. And I kind of look at them and I'm like, we are? Because if you watch the lacrosse players we got, they're doing the same thing you are. <laughs> but whatever, it's, you know, perception is reality. So, but, you know, with our hockey and soccer people, we're going to do more groin work because we're going to look and say, what areas are most frequently injured in these sports? And then we're probably going to put a little more application into those areas that are more specifically injured. So as I said, if we have what we would call overhead athletes, quarterbacks, volleyball players, swimmers, pitchers, tennis players, we're going to have a slightly altered upper body program for them in terms of we're going to have a little bit of a don't list. Okay, we're not going to do these things. And then we're going to have a little bit of a do list. We are going to do these things. We're going to add these things in. So we may add in. I mean, I'm a person. I add in some isolated rotator cuff stuff. I'm not afraid to do internal, external rotation. I'm not such a proud functional guy that, that I'll go away from things that I've seen work for decades. And we won't Olympic lift, generally speaking, with those throwers or people who would, we would consider overhead athletes. And we'll clearly stay away from – they definitely don't snatch. The younger ones clean. But like my pro baseball pitchers, they don't Olympic lift. Because, you know, what are we looking at from a sports standpoint? We're always going to balance risk-reward. What's the reward for a particular exercise versus what's the risk? And I feel like the higher the athlete gets on that um, hierarchy, the more you need to be very delicate with risk-reward. When I worked for the Red Sox for two years, I didn't even think about Olympic lifting. And I love Olympic lifting. Love it, love it, love it. We did not have one athlete who Olympic lifted. And I would have told them not to if they if they tried, because I would feel like the risk reward for a sport in which really the magic is in your hand, in your wrist, in your shoulder. I'm like I can figure out how to get hip and leg power some other way. I love it because really what it is, and I think that where people kind of miss the forest through the trees with those two or three posts that you put up with it is that it's a needs analysis that's looked at in sort of a preventative manner as opposed to a performance manner. Exactly. And it's, and it's more categorical than it is sport. So I would look at the, this, as I said, I would look at certain sports and say, if you are prone to an upper body overuse injury, swimming, tennis, uh, volleyball, baseball, then I'm going to train you a certain way. And I would not say that is baseball specific training or tennis specific training. I would say this is the type of training I would do with someone who's prone to upper body overuse injuries. If groin injury was a major concern in your sport, sports hernia or something along those lines, like hockey and soccer. Okay. These are, this is the 10% that's going to be different for you. And the weird thing for us, the difference a lot of times is more isolated stuff, which goes, um, someone was commenting the other day, about, you know, I don't do any mini band walks and I don't do clamshells and same thing. I'm not averse to isolative stuff for people who I think need isolative stuff. Because again, I think we can get, I think we can become so purist, whether we're on one side of the coin, we're a pure functional training person or on the other side of the coin, we're the pure meathead and not be that guy who can straddle the center of the fence. I want to be the guy that straddles the center of the fence. I want to use functional training when I think it's appropriate and I want to use strength training when I think it's appropriate. And I'm not going to have one foot firmly in either camp, but I'm going to have one foot pretty solidly on either side of that fence. Well, and they should work really in conjunction with each other based upon the needs analysis that you're running. Right, exactly. And they should. And, but, and this is the problem, as I said, on both sides of the coin. My big beef really, you know, yesterday's thing about, you know, unilateral training my biggest beef is the people who in the opposite sense, they don't, I, and you'll like this one. I got to get somebody to do it for me. I'm going to try to film one of my athletes hopping 10 yards against one of them running 10 yards or jumping 10 yards actually. So doing basically double leg jumps for 10 yards against somebody that's running and show somebody the difference. Because that's the absurdity of all these people who just, they don't understand why don't you squat? 
And I'm like, because we don't move that way. It is not neurologically efficient. And, you know, if you tried to hop 10 yards or jump, theoretically, really, two legs, standing long jump, whatever, multiple double leg hops for 10 yards, and then I ran, I'm going to get there way faster than you. Because that reciprocal action is a much better way to, it's the way the body works. But it was the same sort of argument yesterday. So I think what happens is what people really do is they only argue to maintain their belief system. They don't, and, and I'm the total opposite in terms of, I read and listen and watch to learn. And I don't read, listen and watch to produce a defensive reaction in myself. And I think there's a lot of people, like I always joke about people, you know, people like, I read all the time. I read both Elite FTS and T Nation. And I'm like, yeah, that's really good. You consume a tremendous amount of the same information that reinforces exactly what you think. And that's your learning process. Your learning process is basically nodding your head in agreement with other people like you. Whereas I would go the polar opposite and think, go and listen to some people who don't think like you. And then ask yourself, why do these smart people not think like me? And then really sit with those thoughts. Because I can remember, right, you know, and this goes back, I couldn't tell you what year it was, but it might have been the 80s, the first time I really heard Vern Gambetta talk about functional training and talking about unilateral training and, you know, pitcher squats and step ups and one leg squats and all this stuff. And I remember sitting in the audience at an NSCA convention thinking, what is this guy talking about? But then being a little tweaked, like, okay, I need to think about this because what he says about sports being on one leg, wow. You know, think about that. Like, why are people struggling to grasp the sport on one leg thing? That to me is fascinating. Because it, it's like, I always say to people, do you have a TV? Do you actually watch? And then everybody says, well, some basketball players jump off two legs. I'm like, yes, they do. Totally with you. But not that much. <laughs> <laughs> well, and a catcher can hold so, that bottom squat for like the whole inning, but you're not going to put a barbell on a kid's back to him sit on his toes and sit there for 40 minutes. Right, exactly. And that's the, the problem. And like you look at, I always look at that sometimes and think, you know, we always talk, I have, the, I, years ago I wrote an article called, um, Have You Filled a Bucket Today? And it was based on a children's book that my son or daughter, I forget which one, had read in school called, um, Have You Filled a Bucket Today? My wife just yelled son from the other room. So it was my son's class. And basically the idea was that if you fill someone's bucket, you do good things. And if you dip someone's bucket, you do bad things. And I kind of took that analogy and moved it to sport. And the one thing I said is that our job probably is to fill empty buckets or to make sure that buckets are appropriately filled with the right fill. And it's like you said, if I got a catcher who sits like that for all that time, probably the last thing I'm going to do with that guy is a lot of squatting. Because that bucket's pretty darn full. And I might do a little hip dominant work with him. I might do some very quick, like, you know, one or two sets of strength work so that I can maintain the strength of those muscles. But I'm going to try, like, to keep him out of that position. And, and this is where I think, you know, again, some people are almost literally the, the, the opposite in terms of they look at the bucket that's full and think they need to fill it more. That's... We used to go through that with soccer. You know, we need to do more fitness. And yet the reality shows you that in soccer, all you do is fill that sort of middle of the road, middle heart rate zone, something between jogging and sprinting kind of speed. You fill that bucket all day, every day. And then they think, yeah, we got to get more fit. We need to fill that bucket. And I look at it and think, now we probably need to fill the high speed bucket. That's the one we need to fill. And we need to fill the strength bucket because you never put a drop in that one. And we need to fill the power bucket because you never put a drop in that one. And the fitness bucket, you can kind of leave that alone. But again, so I, I could I could ramble on forever. I'm sure you have more. No, but that's really the direction I was hoping that this would go because at the end of the day, what you're doing is you're looking at where the athlete is deficient. You're looking at what parts of whatever these general motor skills that can help improve their performance need to be picked up because they're lagging and you do that. Right. And, and more importantly, you're looking at what they're getting too much of and you're making sure that you decrease that. Like that's one of the things I've always, even with another one of the athletes today asked me about in season training and I'm a huge 
okay, in season strength and rest, because you're getting plenty of stimuli. But how many times have you had coaches say, "Oh yeah, we're out of shape." And I had used to have this article uh, argument. I was really lucky. I worked at Boston University for a guy named Jack Parker, who for almost thirty years, and Coach Parker is the winningest coach in one sport at one school in the history of the NCAA. I think he won 896 games all at the same school. And we won two national championships while I was there, and I think three during his tenure. Went to like a million Final Fours. But he was a bright guy. He would listen, even though he was older. He's um, I'm trying to think. Almost, he's almost 75. Now. He'll be 75 this year. But he was coaching until he was 70. But he'd listen to you. And one of the, you know, coaches would come in and be like, oh, we stunk this week. We're out of shape. We need to skate the kids and get them back in shape. And I used to always look in the meetings and I said, do you think we're um, out of shape or tired? I said, how did we get out of shape if we practice five days a week and play two games? How do we get out of shape? Like, when did this happen? And then they came back with, well, we're just, we don't work hard enough. We don't try hard enough. And I said, so you're saying that the kids that we loved in September, who were the hardest working kids that we know, we loved our team. All those kids' personalities have changed. So they've gotten out of shape and they've undergone a tremendous personality transformation in the last two weeks. And they kind of look at me and they'd be like, uh, I don't, we don't think that that's what's going on. I said, so what are we back to? We're tired. And, and I would literally lobby for rest. Like, let's take a day off. Let's just get in the weight room and lift and not go on the ice. And invariably, we would come back and win the next weekend. We'd sweep that series. But I'd have to have that argument probably once a year in spite of the fact that everybody knew it. But coaches love to revert back to the we're out of shape. We don't work hard. And, you know, strength coaches, you know, we're not strong enough. It's it's all the same kind of tired rhetoric that we that we just keep recycling. Well, right, because it's the easy kind of cop out in a way. Right. It's and it's much easier. That thing I would say. Coaches like to coach because that's their job. And that's even with strength coaches. Strength coaches, um, one of the things that I did in my presentations this summer is I had a slide of, uh, I have a picture of a Bud Light and chocolate ice cream next to each other. And I said, it's not about what you like. Because Bud Light and chocolate ice cream is what I like. If, if I could eat and drink what I wanted all the time, I would drink Bud Light and eat chocolate ice cream every day. But if someone asked me about nutrition, I wouldn't say Bud Light and chocolate ice cream. But when we, from a training perspective, that's what we do all the time. We always want to give everybody our Bud Light and chocolate ice cream. And, and we're not, and this is why I have huge respect. I love Mark Verstegen. He's one of my favorite people in the industry because he was much like I was in the, say, late 90s, where it was just based on, what are the best people in the world doing? Not what do I like to do in my training? Not what did my college strength coach do? Not what I did, no, you know, not what did I do when I played, but what are the best people in the world doing right now? And if you look at Exos and love him or hate him, if you look at the success of Exos worldwide, it was very much based on that idea that we're going to try to figure out what the best people in the world are doing. And then we're going to build a training program around that instead of building a training program around what we like. And, I worked with them for one year. We had some incredible discussions bordering on arguments about what that was, what was the best thing. But we knew it wasn't heavy back squats. We knew it wasn't clean from the floor. There were things that we knew, okay, this isn't the best way to train somebody who makes millions of dollars. This isn't the best way to train somebody who doesn't want to lift weights. And in my mind, it's just not the best way to train anybody. But it was when I was a kid, when I in the eighties, when I first did it, I said, um, my talk this weekend, I said, I, you know, I added strength dysfunction for a living in the eighties. That's what I did. I took people that moved poorly, and I said, can you move poorly with more weight? Because um, that's what the coach would really like to see. And and it took me a while to get out of that groove and to realize that it's not just about you know, because I was a football strength coach, like we all were. I think I think that's where so many of us got our roots and it takes a long time to get rid of those roots, to shed some of those roots. Oh, no doubt about it. And good, bad, or indifferent, you know, the, that next step is really one that I think a lot of people who 
um, have gone on and, and had like continued success and, and really have stayed in the field uh, have made? I would say so. Yeah, uh, it, to a great degree. And and I've also know some of the people who did wouldn't make that step lost their jobs. And and I think it's it is the ability to continue to stay current that will keep you relevant in this field, because I feel like I'm still relevant and I'm almost 60 years old. I haven't aged out. I haven't got to the point where people think, oh, man, old dinosaur is still doing what he was doing. 20 years ago. Um, well, and I think too, that, that being able to correct yourself and openly make changes and evolve is healthy. Oh, I think so. That's what's really funny. Cause that's another, when you look at the internet, I get, I am consistently criticized. I read something the other day on Facebook where someone said, well, I don't follow Mike Boyle. He's all over the map. He's always changing stuff. And I thought, that is the best compliment ever. <laughs> it's like, I don't follow Mike Boyle because I want to do what I've always done. And he's learning. He reads. He does all this stupid stuff like he thinks. And he listens to experts and he changes his thought process. And I don't want any of that. And I thought, like, perfect. I'm glad. We're, we're probably not. We weren't meant to be together, me and whoever random poster was on Facebook that day. But it is amazing that you can be criticized in our industry for learning, which I always laugh about. I make jokes about it all the time. If people are going to criticize me because I read and because I listen and because I go and sit in the front at seminars and try to figure out, okay, who's doing this better than I am, then I'm doing the right things. Well, and I think too, uh, is another person who, you know, prides himself on, on trying to spread good information and doing things of that nature. Like, I think that, that people like us just intrinsically feel like we have a responsibility to continue to learn if we're going to pass on information. I think, yeah, I think you have a responsibility to continue to learn if you're going to coach. Never mind pass on information. If people are going to put their faith in you, as they do with me and with you and with so many people like us, we have a responsibility to stay current, it's no different than a mechanic who saw, I'm not learning about cars anymore, they got all these electronic things in them. Um, I'm just, you know, just bring me old cars to fix and I can do that. I mean, you won't stay employed very long, right? I mean, there's so many industries where it's like this. It'd be like a doctor saying, yeah, that, that arthroscopy stuff, I'm not gonna learn any of that. I'm just gonna continue doing open surgery. I just wanna cut people open and be able to look around inside. I don't like this idea of like looking through the camera inside the joint, that's silly. I mean, in any other field, we would be ridiculed for doing the things that, that so many of us do. But in a field like ours, it's literally almost applauded. Like if you're a stupid meathead who's still doing the same thing that he was doing 20 years ago, there's an audience of people who think that's great. And you know, one of the things that I've said is that, um, I, again, I have all these slides. I put a picture of, in my slides the other day of a covered wagon and an airplane. And if you said to me, hey, I want to go, um, I want to go across country. And you said, um, you know, I want to go across country and I'm, I'm going to take a covered wagon because that's the best way to get from here to um, California. And I said, well, Jay, actually, you know, uh, about 100 years ago or 80 years ago, whatever, they invented airplanes and um, they work really well and you can get to California a lot faster. And you were like, no, 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 I, I, I got a covered wagon, you know, and I'm getting my supplies ready and my family and I are going. I mean, that's the absurdity of some of the people in our field in my mind is that they're literally like, no, I'm a covered wagon guy. I just, uh, that, that's, uh, that's always worked, you know, worked in the Oregon Trail and uh, it continues to work well. I, I look at literally, I look at too many people in our field and think covered wagon guy. Yeah, and that's not to say that there aren't some things that are tried and true and shown that they work and have worked and always worked. I mean, like like Hank always talks about, he's like, there's a reason people still do yoga. There's a reason people still do, um, you know, needling and things like that because they've been around for hundreds and thousands of years because they work. Yeah, and it's funny. I had this conversation this weekend. I was in San Francisco. And one of the things I said, I think training is a lot more akin to archaeology. 
uh, than anything else in terms of, I think we're finding lots of things. The difference is in the ability to explain the things in ways that make sense. Because I know for a long time I fought the yoga people because they wanted me to do two hours of yoga a week with my athletes. And I said, I don't have, I have eight hours a week. I can't afford two weeks for what's effectively going to be stretching. And whereas if someone in yoga had said to me, Hey, I'm going to come in and do some really good 20 minute sessions for your athletes. I probably would have bought into yoga 20 years ago. And I can tell you, I couldn't get one yoga instructor to bite on that as many times as I asked them. No, we have to do it for an hour because that's how you do it. It's like, well, we don't have that, so we're not going to do it at all. We'll just stretch on our own. And then what we'll do is what we do now. We'll do things that look like yoga. And then the yoga people come in and go, all those stretches you do, they're yoga. I'm like, yep, but you wouldn't do it for 15 minutes, so we're doing it on our own. And it's just, and like you said, needling. And hey, I'm, you know what I'm into now, which is, it's the most embarrassing thing in my world, sprinting. I realize that. We don't sprint enough, particularly in the Northeast where it's cold. And Tony Holler, I give Tony credit for this. And if you don't know, do you know, have you met or read any of Tony's stuff? Yeah, I had him on uh, last summer too. He's, he's super. Brilliant, right? Yeah. But like me, 59-year-old school teacher, chemistry teacher, right? But the one thing from, I'm listening to him and I'm thinking, man, you know, we don't run fast enough. We don't run with intent often. We time tens now two days a week, every week, for as long as we have our athletes, either tens or flying tens. And I have um, my son, so I have a 14 year old. My son has lowered his 10 yard dash time in one year, exactly one calendar year, 187 to 152. So like 0.35 in a 10. Some of that is maturation. He's grown six inches. But I am 100% certain that the major reason he's getting faster is because I asked him to run fast. I didn't ask him to run. I asked him to run fast. And then, as Tony talks about, record, rank, publish. I recorded those times. He knows what his best 10-yard dash time is. He knows what he's trying to beat. And I would look at that and think, everybody should go like, duh, yeah, Mike, I get it. But then I'd ask, how many people do you know, like me, who were timing people two or three times a year to see if their their program worked? Failing to look at then because you looked at sprinting as a test, not as a tool. Now I'm looking at it as a tool, and I'm writing that down because I realized that's a, a really good way to describe what I just wanted to describe. <laughs> well, yeah, it was sensational, and it, you know. It's as simple as looking at it as like, well, I mean, we talk about all the time, if you want to be fast, you got to do things fast. But really, if you want to be fast, you better freaking be running fast. Yeah. And that's, and it was really funny because, again, I'm, I did the, a presentation at Altus. And, um, and one of the things that I put um, a picture of Ben Johnson and uh, Carl Lewis in. And I was like, what do these two guys have in common? And in some ways you could look and say, well, you know, not very much. They were sort of the, maybe the yin and yang of sprinting. You know, one guy, the short, stocky, steroid weightlifter guy. The other guy, the tall, lanky track guy, right? What's in common? They both tried to run fast a lot. And as a result, they both got really fast. Yeah. You know, yet you'd look at it and think there was almost a dichotomous approach in how these guys trained. You know, one guy was not a weight room guy and the other guy was a huge weight room guy. And in some ways you could look at it and think, well, how did they both get such great results? And in my mind suddenly it was like, because they did something in common. They both ran fast for time. And that was what Tony stuff, when you start thinking that, you know, and it's, I pulled out a lot of the stats, uh, Ashley Jones had all these stats about different speeds. This is why I laugh at now. I, I laugh like the West Side stuff. People talk about dynamic lifting. I think dynamic lifting is a complete waste of time because it's too slow. Don't take exercises that were meant to be done slow and try to do them fast. Find exercises you can do fast. And sprinting is 10 meters per second. Bad sprinters go eight meters per second. Great 
snatchers go like 1.5. It, it makes the snatch seem really inferior from like a speed and power development to the actual act of sprinting when you realize that sprinting is somewhere depending on the athlete, you know, six to six to seven to eight times faster in terms of what you're doing. And then I, JB Marin just did a great article about sprinting as injury prevention. I don't know if you read that one, but that was just, I haven't yet. Oh, and it was, well, um, I think I, if you look at my Twitter, I think I retweeted it, but he basically says in the start of the article, something like, um, good athletes are fast, fast, fast athletes get hurt. Therefore, good athletes should not run fast. And it was like, you know, and then he goes on to explain, obviously, why that logical thought process is illogical. But that's what a lot of teams were doing. And I was doing it to some degree. Hey, these guys are super explosive and they tend to get injured. So I'm going to try to keep them from getting injured. That seems to make sense. Until you realize that what it is about them that makes them super explosive is what's getting them injured. I have a, I had a um, Premier League striker that I've worked with on and off the last couple of years. And one of the things that I said to him is, you've got to sprint. You have to run in your off season. You've got to run these 10s. I started timing him in the 10. And he runs the first one. He literally ran like my son. He ran like a 1.8. I was like, you can't. No, that's too slow. And he, you could tell he was like, well, I'm afraid I'm going to hurt myself. And I was like, that's the whole point. You need to run fast. I said, because when the game, when that ball goes in the air and you have to go get it, you are not going to go get it slowly because you're afraid you're going to hurt yourself. You're just going to hurt yourself. You're going to access that 100% that you have, that you have not accessed in training for a really long time, and that will probably cause your hamstring to fail. So we've realized that sprinting as injury prevention is probably your number one technique because you think how do people get hurt right oh, 100%. Yeah. yeah so but i looked at it and that's why i titled the presentation 37 years at the train station waiting for my ship to come in <laughs> you know because it was like i was in the wrong place i was just not i didn't get it and i didn't get it for a long time well, but I think too the the best part is when you can figure those things out and move forward. And I think that's one thing that so so profoundly and perfectly was said by that guy on on Facebook is is one thing that you've always done is is whenever you come out with something new, you also mention what you've changed and what you've moved away from, and the whys and what's to it. And if anyone's asking for more from someone when it comes to a sharing and open and honest and candid statement, um, I mean, other than like your social security number, I don't know what more you could give them. No. And then, and I look at that, that's what I think is interesting too. And that's why I think I've been lucky, particularly more maybe in the last decade, but I think I've definitely developed more of that kind of abundance mentality. I'm not afraid. I think it's amazing whenever I see people like, Oh, I don't want anybody to know what we're doing. I look at it and think, trust me, I've told everybody in the world what I'm doing, and the vast majority of the people just want to defend what they're doing. They're not interested in what I'm doing. I look at people and say, we have a massive business with literally some of the best athletes in the world, and then when we tell people what we're doing, people explain to us why we're wrong and why they should continue doing what they were doing. That's my talk for this year. Change is good. You go first, which is a... Uh, a nice little simple book, but it's amazing. I, and the thrust of the book or the thrust of the presentation for me is a lot of my former interns, former employees, former GAs who I know are still stuck. In, they're still doing what we were doing when they left. I can't tell you the number of people who worked for me or with me at some point whose programs I look at now and think that program is a carbon copy or worse than what they did when they were with us. In some ways, they've gone backwards. I look at some people who've gone back to things that we don't do. And I'm fascinated. I'm fascinated by people's inability to take free information from successful people and put it to use. So I have no fear at all, zero. Well, I appreciate all that you've done, Coach, and I appreciate you taking the time to share all this with us today. This is fantastic. Thank you so much. 
Well, thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Like I said, you keep up the good work. You've done an amazing job of trying to to do exactly what I'm trying to do, which is help people to get better. Um, obviously, your what you've been doing with your seminars and stuff has been um, incredibly helpful, just industry wide. So keep it up. Appreciate it, Coach. Thanks so much. And, uh, appreciate the time, man. People are going to love this. We'll be in touch real soon. All right. Let me know when it's up. Will do. Yes, sir. Okay. Thanks, thanks Coach. Have a good All one. Right. And a huge thanks to Mike Boyle for spending the time with us today, guys. You know, I, I think that there is a lot of confusion about these terms, and um, I, I think that people get confused and they kind of miss the forest from the trees, and I can't thank Mike enough for being so open, honest, and candid about his opinions of the, on the situation and what he's seen uh, with his time up there in Boston and what he's had success with and what has driven his program to to be where it is today. Uh, you know, and, and guys, Mike's a, a guy that, you know, it, some people may consider him polarizing in, in how he looks at things, but to, to be completely frank, the, the profession wouldn't be what it is if it wasn't for people like Coach Boyle, uh, you know, driving the profession forward, bringing more information, being open to discussing things, being open to learning and reevaluating how, how he's coaching so he can better help us all have a better idea of, of what we're doing. So, Coach, can't thank you enough for not just being on with us today, but for all that you've done to, to specifically make me a better coach and to make the profession a better place. And as always, guys, if you did enjoy the talk, please share it through the social media outlet of your choice, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, whatever it may be. We, again, we're just trying to get the best information out there to all the great coaches that we can. And as always, guys, thank you for everything that you do for us here at Central Virginia Sport Performance. We will be back next week with another awesome guest. We will see you then.